pleased to be joined by Kevin Lace. First of all, I want to start out by telling you thank you for serving our country. I appreciate that. As a former Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 3, you served our country. You're from Middlefield, Connecticut, and lots of great stuff is starting to happen to you. You're in an Oscar-nominated movie, mm -hmm. six Oscars. You did two tours of duty for our country. So I want to tell your story about who Kevin Lace is. All right, you grew up in Middlefield, Connecticut. You're a swimmer. Somewhere along the line, you sign up for the military. How did that happen? Well, you know, a lot of great things have been happening. You know, I come from a great family, you know, um, come from Middlefield, and I've you know, been really blessed throughout life. And, um, you know, as I was born in Meriden, moved to Middlefield, went to middle school there, and, um, you know, ended up going to Xavier and had a great time there. The next step for me was college and I went to James Madison University, and I started in 2000. <clears throat> I kind of, you know, moved through college. I wouldn't say I just grabbed what the bull by the horns. You know, I didn't grab the bull by the horns. You were having a good time? I had a good time, <laughs> and I, you know, I enjoyed college, but it wasn't something where I, like, risked. I was the first person in my family to go to a four-year institution, to a, you know, to a university, and, you know, it was something that I just, the next step after Xavier was, was college, and I wanted to be a doctor, but, you know, I wasn't excelling. And it just wasn't me. You know, I did great in high school. Um, and college was just something different. And um, it was really the events of 9-11 that shook me to the core and made me risk and take a chance. And I'd, you know, lost a good friend as dad, Bruce Eagleson, was killed in the Trade Center. And um, I remember coming back for the memorial service. And, you know, I'd lost my grandmother before, you know, years before. but. Bruce was like my dad's age, you know, and, mm -hmm. and to see that loss and to see it in such a catastrophic, you know, um, it, you know, a, a destructive way and thousands of other Americans, it, it made me question what I was doing and am I really operating to my full potential? So I came home at the end of that semester and I told my parents I was going to uh, leave school and join the military. And Had you ever thought about the military <clears throat> before 9-11? No. No, my grandfather was in the Navy. He joined after um, after Pearl Harbor, and I told my parents I was going to join the Navy, and they looked at me kind of cross-eyed, like, what are you doing? Um, but they were supportive, and that was the main thing. And, and anything that I've done, you know, from the very beginning has always been, you know, received with support from my parents. So I went down to the recruiting office in Middletown, and, you know, you go in there, and you walk down the hallway, and I just walked into the the Navy, you know, a couple of them were closed, the Army, the Marines, but the Navy was open. So I walk in and, you know, I actually had a genuine recruiter. You know, I sat down and looked around. I saw a poster and it had a bunch of SEALs climbing out of the water with big old handlebar mustaches and guns. And I was like, I want to do that. I'd seen two movies before. I saw The Rock that had a little bit of SEALs and I saw Charlie Sheen's Navy SEALs. And that was my only real, you know, taste of Navy SEALs before walking to that recruiting office. And you're a swimmer. And I was a swimmer in high school. I swam, but it was all sprint work. It was 50 in the 100, two in free, four, four free relay. So distance wasn't in, you know, anything over like 200 yards. I was like, I'm done. All right, butterfly, nothing. You got me there. <laughs> it was sprint, I'm out of the pool. So distance swimming was something I had to work at. But, you know, I, I was intrigued. It was something that this is a whole other world and it's something different. I, you know, if you ask my parents, you ask my friends, I like doing different stuff and really the decision to join this to to try to become a seal was something you know outside of my normal wheelhouse and <clears throat> it was something i was intrigued i knew i could challenge myself mentally physically and you know it, it it provided a great future what is it like to be a navy seal how do you sum that up because we lay mm -hmm. people understand that this mm -hmm. is so hard, many don't make it. Mm -hmm. How did you make it? Um, if I had to sum it up training-wise in one phrase to you know, sum up basic underwater demolition SEAL training, I'd have to say it's the most fun you never want to have again. Does that make sense? Um, it's running until you can't run and then you run some more. Swimming until you can't swim, you swim some more. Push-ups on the grinder, PT on the grinder, you know, mental and physical strain beyond anything you've ever, you know, imagined, and then some more. 
and you're in Southern California. It's beautiful. I mean, you should be happy because the sun's shining, you know, the weather's clear, mm -hmm. the water's cold. There's some sharks out there, but you should love it. You're in Southern California. Um, but training, it's really the most fun you never want to have again. And some of my closest friends to this day are guys that I went through training with. Um, so deciding to go to Bud's, you know, is one thing. Mm -hmm. Actually getting there and performing is another. And once you conquer it, well, some, you know, conquer is relative. But once you finish, it's that... You know, that badge of honor, you've completed something that 85% of the people that even try can't do. So it really, you know, sets you apart and it, it helps build that confidence that was really always there. You just had to find the right wheelhouse to plug in and try it. You know what I'm saying? So you become a SEAL. <clears throat> How soon thereafter do you go to the Middle East? It was a while. You know, the training process, I, I, I finished BUDS and then I had to go to jump school. And then I went to SEAL qualification training. And that's when I became a SEAL. So it was really you know, over a year of training before mm -hmm. I got the pin. Um, and from there, I went to the Special Operations Combat Medic School at Fort Bragg, where I worked with SEAL medics, uh, Ranger medics, Air Force medics. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I learned how to be a first responder in a Special Operations unit. All the while, this, mm -hmm. is, this is feeding your soul. This, it feels to Kevin that you're in the, in the right place, mm -hmm. you're doing the right thing, you're jazzed by this. Mm -hmm. This felt good to your core. That was great. You know, I'm around guys that, you know, challenge me each and every day. You know, I didn't, it w there's that phrase that you have to earn your trident every day. You know, you wear this pin that there are many people before you that have worn it. And, a lot, you know, some have died wearing that pin. Mm -hmm. And you have to uphold that standard each and every day. And I felt like I was challenged day in and day out in a, in a way I've never been before. So, yes, it was, you know, I was energized, you know, excited. You know, something I was very, very proud of. Um, and after that training, I, I ended up at SEAL Team 3. It was actually a coin flip with a buddy of mine, and I ended up on the West Coast at Team 3. Team it, 3 is what? It's one of the SEAL teams. Um, and then, Specializing in any particular thing? Before, it used to, but after 9-11, you know, it's all SEAL teams do pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. You get to the Middle East. You're a kid mm -hmm. from Middlefield, mm -hmm. Connecticut. What happens? You realize, you realize that the Middle East is a little hot, a little hotter than Middlefield. And you're in danger mm -mm. every day. And what does that take me there? You don't tell your mom that stuff. No, you don't. No, um, you know, I, I got to SEAL Team 3, and I really, you know, I, I felt I blossomed. You know, I met guys that were hungry, guys that were very goal-oriented, guys that wanted to go down range and, and, you know, to put it bluntly, do bad things to bad people because that's why you do it. You don't join to be a fast runner or a fast swimmer. You go down range to take the fight to the enemy. And I think that's hard for people to conceptualize because you can watch the videos, you can hear the stories, but it's really how people are hardwired, how SEALs are hardwired. Because, you know, that, that, that thought of combat, a lot of people run away from. SEALs, Special Forces, Rangers, those guys run towards it. So when I got to Iraq, I knew I was there. You know, I was a little anxious because I didn't know what to expect, but I knew that's the reason why I joined. I didn't join to wear the pin. I joined to go and be among those ranks and go do that job. Um, so Iraq was different. You know, it's, it's one of those you're in constant combat. And where we were at in Ramadi it was, you know, the epicenter of the Sunni awakening. It was where the Sunni tribe and the, the extremist faction was taking arms from Syria and moving them down to Baghdad. And our job was to interdict that you know, to aid the Marines and the Army working in that city. The movie in which you're in, American Sniper, you meet Chris Kyle. How soon do you meet him after you get to the Middle East? I met him before, when I got to SEAL Team 3. Um, I was there not too long, and he had come back from his deployment in Fallujah. And he had already gained a little bit of a reputation. You know, he had had some success in Fallujah, the, first, the second battle of Fallujah. And, um, the most lethal sniper in U.S. history. Not at that point going to be yes and chris chris was very humble from the get-go and after you know he's at 162 he's still very humble and he was the first guy to take all that credit and deflect it to the people around him like chris was the epitome of a team player mm -hmm. and you wouldn't expect you know that guy over there the humble guy would be the most lethal sniper he was that type of dude you know he would take all that credit and these are the people around me this is the reason why i'm good because we're a team Tell me about moments you shared with him as snipers in the Middle East. Um, How did you, know, you have each other's backs? Well, uh, you know, as, as teammates, each job 
in the platoon is, um, you know, very important. So, you know, we have our comms guys, our snipers, and, you know, when we're on rooftops, we spend a lot of time together, and there's always that danger, you know, Chris is on the gun, I'm on watch, and we've got another sniper face in another direction. You can get a grenade lobbed up on that rooftop, and what are you gonna do? So it's that, you know, constant vigilance because we're teammates, we're team guys, and I'm there to get his back and vice versa, and not just Chris, but everybody else on the team in the platoon. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's one of those things where, you know, that just being a part of that team makes you want to protect your buddy and not let them down. How do you prepare yourself for what you end up doing in the Middle East? How do you mentally prepare yourself for that? You saw a lot. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's one of those things that I think I personally believe, you know, it's one of those things where you're programmed. You know, it's, it's just the way I'm hardwired. Um, you know, nobody, the Navy's not gonna prepare me for exactly what's gonna happen, but they're gonna put me in different situations to try and, you know, replicate and try and prepare. But you'll never really prepare when you lose a buddy right next to you. Um, you're never really gonna prepare when you see probably one of the most, you know, despicable things ever, you know, in, in, in some of the t things we saw over in Iraq with, you know, the, um, some of the factions of what we see today in the Middle East. And you see that savagery. No, there's nothing really to prepare you, but you know that you're part of a group that has withstood, you know, the training to get to that level, that your nation expects you to go ahead and do those jobs when others may fail. This movie, American Sniper, <clears throat> is based on his story. Bradley Cooper plays him, you play you. How is it that you get called on to this movie? What, ha what happens? Social media is amazing, and this is the story. Um, I was in North Carolina. I was going through uh, Wake Forest PA program, and my wife was teaching at Fairfield Ward, and I moved down there with the entire house. Like, I took everything, you know, to get ready to and get the whole family to move in. And Lindsay was home with a child, a crib, a laptop, and an air mattress for about a month and a half, and she saw in the news that Bradley Cooper's production company and Warner Brothers had bought the rights to American Style. We should say this is post- you're fighting in, in all yes, of that. Yes, we're, we're out yeah. of the Navy. This is yes. uh, 2012, I believe. Um, yeah, about May 2012. And she went on Facebook and saw that Jason Hall was the writer. Actually, it was in the article. And found Jason Hall, and he'd recently liked American Sniper, so she's like, that's got to be the guy. Sends him a message and was like, very, very polite. You know, this is an amazing story. There's a lot of very important gentlemen that have done a great job. There's no need to make this over the top. And Jason was, you know, picked his interest, and he was like, well, help me get this story correct. So they started a little dialogue, and Lindsay eventually, you know, fed me in and let me know that she had been talking to the writer of American Sniper, and we started a conversation, and, you know, Chris and I were friends in the military and also friends outside. So I told Chris, I was like, hey, talking to this guy, Jason Hall. Um, he's like, hey, man, it's Hollywood. He's like, he's cool, but, you know, he's Hollywood. So, um, you know, I was working with Chris and Jason to give a little bit of technical, seal technical uh, detail to his script. And Jason finished the first draft of the script the day before Chris was murdered. Then what happens? Um, <clears throat> Jason was crushed. And, it, and he was killed by somebody we believe that had PTSD. Yeah, yeah it's speculated. But, you know, the, what really, you know, Jason was crushed, and you know, it's something that he'd studied Chris. It was, it's a character study, and um, you know, Chris was something that was very important to a lot of us. And uh, I'd asked Jason to come down to Texas and meet the SEALs that, you know, formed that team uh, that was part of Chris's story. So Jason came down, he was the only Hollywood guy there, and kind of worked as a liaison to, you know, plug him in and have him meet the family. And it was, um, it was important to the story, because Jason was able to, you know, he'd met Chris before and they'd hung out, but it, it was different now because Chris was gone. It was important to him <clears throat> and important to you get, to get this story right. This is the lasting legacy of Chris Cotton. Some people would say this is not exactly true. You would say what to that? What's not true? The movie. It's, you know, it's a representation. You know, we don't have Chris. It's not Chris yeah. Kyle, you know, up there as the But they had you, and you saw a lot of what happened. I was fortunate to be there. You know, it was an honor to, to serve next to Chris and Ryan Job and Mark Lee. It was a privilege to you know, be at that position to help tell that story. Because as Bradley and I sat down, we realized, and, you know, he told me, coach me, it's, it's storytelling. And it's how well can you go back and remember the details? How can you point out to me this is what Chris would do in this situation? How can we make it most realistic with, you know, the limitations that we have, budget, time, location? Mm -hmm. um, and 
being, Chris was a mentor to me as a young sniper. You know, I, well, you study your mentor, you know, because eventually you want to be that master. And, you know, as a young sniper, I watched Chris and I watched other SEALs around. I was very observant. You know, as a sniper, you always observe. And I felt, you know, very well positioned as a technical advisor to lend credence to, hey, this is how SEAL teams do it. And bring that authenticity to the movie and help make it, you know, what it is with the help of everybody else, you know, on set. Okay, let's see that trailer right now. We're going to roll it and see some of your work in Bradley Cooper's. All right. Let me ask you a question, Chris. Would you be surprised if I told you that the Navy has credited you with over 160 kills? Do you ever think that you might have seen things or done some things over there that you wish you hadn't? Oh, that's not me, no. What's not you? I don't tell you enough. I'm so proud of you. You're such a great father. So you're not worried about what might happen? I'm willing to meet my creator and answer for every shot that I took. I'll pick it up. Drop it. I'm stateside. You're home? What, what are you doing? I guess I just needed a minute. <laughs> the thing that haunts me are all the guys that I couldn't say. I'm ready. Oh my God. I'm ready to come home. Kevin, how is it that you're able to be in a movie after living all of that and then, and then do it over again? Well, you know, there's craft services on the other side of that wall right there. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you method act. I'm playing myself in the movie. I have to put myself back into those situations back in 2006 and, you know, go through that and help tell the people around me so they're in context, so they know what it's like to be there as best as we can with the resources available. Um, but it's just a re it's a representation, and we do the best that we can with the tools that, that we have. But that had to pull up so many memories of what happened over there. It does, you know, and and it's it's catharsis in storytelling form. It's being able to work through. It's being able to tell. It's being able to educate. And as I educate you or I educate people on set, you know, it helps me. And it's one of the the communication tool is so calming. It's so effective. It it permeates and it helps everybody around. And I feel like. You know, we've, we've all seen things in combat, and the more you're able to articulate and talk about it, you know, you learn from, you know, what goes on, and you help educate people, and they have a reference point of where you've been. Um, so, you know, I felt it was very powerful to the movie and help, you know, make it authentic to the guys who weren't there, those actors that weren't there. All right, you've worked <clears throat> with Bradley Cooper, and you said it yourself, and Clint Eastwood. So where do you go from there? You're, you're in an Academy Award nominated mm. movie your first time out. So is there more mm. acting to come? You know, I won't close that door. I really won't. Um, you know, I've, I've had a, I've, I have a very supportive wife. You know, I've, I have great kids. And, you know, I want to do what's best for them. Um, you know, people ask me what's the hardest thing about, you know, the teams, and it's really leaving. You know, like we talked earlier, it's, it's a brotherhood that you can't pay money to get into. It's a brotherhood you can't knock on that secret door and get into. It's one of those things that it's really all about you to get there. And walking away from that is tough. 
and I have a great family and, and you know, providing for them is priority number one. And I work as a physician assistant. And part of my job is to work with active duty and veterans with the Eagle Fund and see guys that are, you know, at a part, a time in their life that they need, you know, that provider that's been there before to help, you know, shepherd them through, you know, changes and, and help them get back to that fighting speed that they were at. Um, so that's part of that catharsis. That's that giving back. Well, I hope that you win an Academy Award. I hope so too. I hope you have fun on the red carpet. Mm. And I thank you so much for coming on and giving us a background of who you are and what you're doing and where you're headed. Thanks, right. Kevin, and thanks for serving our country. Thank you so much. I made a journey on pursuit, swam one they sand, boys just go spend all night kissing, and a bomb is right here, then who else is missing? Got a little sidetracked to find my solution, and find the keys to the door, but it's also a metaphor. Locked in the grocery store of a mine Just to save time Skip right ahead to the last ride The harder we 